Well, welcome everybody. It's um, not any surprise at all to see that every, not only is every room, every seat in the room filled, but new seats are being brought in, um, and more people will no doubt be brought in later on to fill them. Um, it's we have a program today on a subject of enormous interest: um, the social impact of the Roman army, and two amazing speakers uh, to take us through it. But before we begin, um, I wanted to say a few words to welcome everybody. Um, and also um, to welcome members of the two societies and others to come as well. As you all know, we're in the middle of um, launching a huge um, campaign in support of the, the Joint Library, the library that's on the third floor of this building. And some of you, would I know, have been to the Bloomberg Tablets presentation a little while ago, um, and have heard a little bit about some of the giving campaigns that are being organised there. And if there's anybody who would like to get involved in annual giving, or in legacy material, there are materials at the back that people are very welcome to take and sign um, as they go, or as they stay. Because you'll be invited to stay after the lectures for a drink, um, to meet the speakers, uh, to interrogate them. We'll get, you have a chance to interrogate them from the floor, of course, in the normal way. Um, so without very much further ado, I want to move on to the two speakers. Uh, two speakers today, I'll say a little bit about each of them now, rather than jump in halfway through. Uh, we have Ian Haynes from the University of Newcastle and Penelope Pim Allison from the University of Leicester. Uh, each of them have done, in a way, um, an enormous, have worked enormous change for the way in which the Roman army has been studied. Uh, I, I actually went back to um, my lecture notes from being an undergraduate in Oxford at the lectures of Shepherd Freer. And Shepherd Freer used to lecture on the Roman army, and some here would have heard, heard those lectures. And he did it on a two-year cycle. The first year you got 24 lectures on the Rhine frontier, and the next year you got 24 lectures on the Danube frontier. At the Rhine frontier, the photos were much better. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, they were extraordinary lectures, and you followed the Roman army almost week by week as it stumped about in, in, in the mud. Um, and um, because uh, Stefan had a healthy disrespect for foreign pronunciation, he would always descend to a, to a a low mumble when we got to foreign names. So it took me a very long time to work out that Vestra wasn't the same as the Vestra. Um, and only these enormous, wonderful maps which he used to produce gave me any sense of what was going on. And what was going on um, was really complete, it was an entirely internal game of soldiers moving backwards and forwards from camp to camp and moving around. This, this gave a fantastic foundation. But by the end of those 48 lectures, I had absolutely no idea about what it was like to be a Roman soldier. Um, I, I, I knew what they looked like, I knew what their equipment looked like, I knew roughly, I knew an inor inordinate amount about what their barracks looked like, or rather the, the post cells that made up their barracks. Um, but I had very little idea about what was going on otherwise. And it's filling in that picture that's been part of the great work of Romano-British military archaeology um, in recent years. And many people have participated, I can see some people in the room participated particularly, and are much better qualified than I am to give this overview, uh, but in particular I want to pick out the achievements uh, of Ian and Pim. Uh, in 1999 there's published uh, a volume edited by Ian and by Adrian Goldsworthy, who's here as well tonight, which is great, entitled The Roman Army as Community, and that brought together for perhaps for the first time a lot of people who wanted to think about the Roman Army as a set of social relations, a set of you know, activities, entertainments, as a, as a as a stage in life that you go through. And that began to piece out something which at the time it was still all it was still all boys. It was, it was the Roman Army's community was still very much a male club. Um, but it got a lot of things going and it was a very lively conference. I remember John Casey, um, who sadly passed away being there making lots of contributions to the floor in his rather inimitable style. <laughs> and I expect Ian does as well because he probably he and, um, he and Age had to chair the whole thing. <laughs> but it was a great occasion. Um, it was in this building, indeed, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. uh, now, Ian's gone on from that and he's, he's worked on. Uh, he's, he's spent a lot of time in. He spent almost as much time in Eastern Europe as George Smiley. Um, <laughs> uh, most recently, he's been working in Bulgaria, Greece, before that, Aculum in Romania. Um, later this month, I fly to Germany to examine a thesis on the, on the archaeology of cults. In Romania, and Ian's name is on almost every footnote. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but he touched on my things as well. <laughs> 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 and 
And then in this country of Mary Porter, so many people think of him very much as sort of Mr. Roman Army community, um, and some may even have, taken, have observed the move. Ian has another side. Uh, when, when things are too cold on the northern frontier, he takes heavy equipment down to the basement of San Giovanni in Letteranda and scans. And, and I think, in fact, the last time we met, I think it was the Roman Archaeology Conference, when we took the Roman Archaeology Conference to La Sapienza, and uh, Ian rushed out from a corner with a laptop and said, look, we've got ostriches. <laughs> <laughs> and there's amazing pictures of ostriches. And, you know, yeah, could this be the, the famous ostrich that nearly had his head cut off? Um, Tim's been working in quite another way, but also has a very wide interest uh, beyond the Roman army. Her, her work's evolved out of a set of pioneering studies on household archaeology, particularly spatial analysis of objects. Yeah. Sorry. You're most welcome at the Roman Society, yeah. It is, yeah. Oh, of course. Come have a seat. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I should have been late. <laughs> All are very welcome. Tim's been started working on household archaeology and family archaeology <laughs> uh, in very different terrain and still maintains an interest in this. And I, I've got a note because I'm not going to otherwise uh, pronounce Kinchaig Archaeological Research Project <laughs> properly. Uh, Tim has been operating not only on the northern frontier uh, but also uh, in the Antipodes uh, in her native Australia and continues to maintain research interests in both. She'll also be very well known to people in this room for work in Pompeii, particular in the insula of the Menanda. And we look at these extraordinary houses, we see the wall paintings, or we, if we look at them through Andrew Wallace Hatchell's work, we sort of see a bird's eye view when none of the walls visible. And Tim is one of those people who has actually sat down and tried to work out how these houses work, and do it by looking in enormous detail at what objects are where, how rooms are used, and all those sorts of ideas we thought we knew, what the cubiculum is, what the tabulator is, once it comes under the kind of analysis that Tim puts to it, we realise quite how complicated and flexible these spaces are. And it's been a real revelation. And, and one really only possible with the, with the house we excavated most recently. And then moved on from this to do something similar in those same marching camps that Shepherd Free used to tell me about. <laughs> and moving through these camps, um, trying to work out what's going on. Now, extraordinary things have turned out. And we're only going to find out in the course of these two lectures about how Roman camps and spaces and social spaces are used. And it really is a very different archaeology of the Roman army that we're going to have uh, glimpses of tonight from two experts. I'm not going to say any more except to say how very pleased we are to have both of them here tonight. Um, and so I hope you will join me in offering them a huge welcome. <laughs> Now, Ian is going to begin, and then Pim will follow, and then we will take a few questions after both of them together. So I pass. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very much. So I'm going to start off with, with someone who is decidedly not a poster boy for uh, Roman native relations, um, but representing his very own form of uh, impact, military impact on society, uh, the very familiar uh, face of Longinus, a Thracian cavalryman uh, from Colchester. Remember him, if you hadn't met him before, because he will uh, return to haunt us later. Now, rather though than a first century tombstone in Colchester, I'd like to start, please don't read it all just yet, uh, with some words from a very, very famous Greek orator, uh, delivered uh, in Rome in front of the imperial court in the time of Antonius Pius. Now this is sheer rhetoric. We're not supposed to regard this as a precise or accurate statement of the state of the world in the second century AD. Uh, but nonetheless, it conveys certain messages and certain ideas that I find to be remarkably resilient. On the one hand, there is this sense of cities perhaps cleared of a military presence. This speech, remember, being delivered in Rome. And on the other, we have trouble, if it occurs, is on the borders, where there is madness and wickedness, uh, which has to be dealt with. And of course, around this Roman world, so secure at this golden time, uh, according to Aristides, 
there is a second line, rather like a town wall, and it is this that actually protects civilization. And Aristides uh, actually uh, makes a specific reference to us here, the great outermost island towards the west, an exemplar of where this uh, wall or walled world actually ends. Now, I'd like you to keep those oppositions in mind for a moment, because what I'd like to do is confront them both uh, now um, in a brief discussion of uh, the social impact of the Roman army. And my approach is going to be as, followed, as follows. First of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the methodological issues uh, that we confront. Uh, from then, I'm going to go on and actually talk about the presence of armed and belted men armed and belted men, that very visual uh, creature who essentially is the Roman soldier or paramilitary and who carries with him in those arms and weapons the emperor's authority. And I'm then going to take two periods, if you like, from Roman history. First of all, under Hadrian and then under Severus. And I'm going to look at the same two places and some of the themes that are emerging on those and to ask what implications those have uh, for the way in which society is changing, how far they are similar, how far they are different. Um, and then I am going to conclude by bringing us back, I hope, to a personal note, an individual human note, because although we are talking about social impact writ large, we are, of course, dealing with a series of transformations that have impact on multiple individuals. Let us not forget them. So methodology and metrics. First of all, it's all very well to say I'm going to talk about social impact. What is social impact? How far can we measure it? Can we, in fact, measure it easily in the ancient world? And at what level should we consider it? At the individual, at the community, at the regional, at the provincial, at the imperial? Another question, which touches directly on what Greg said, is how much of this impact takes place outside what we've come to call the military community. And this is a very important point, I think. Uh, one of the things that I hope we've seen, um, and uh, Greg alluded to this earlier on, is that the army is not just seen now as a bunch of people in, with swords in sandals. It is actually seen as part of an extended community with a whole range of dependents, individuals whose lives are bound up with that professional group. How far are the families, the servants, those selling the sol things to the soldiers, their followers, actually a relatively isolated group in larger society? And how far is the impact of uh, the army socially going beyond them? That's something I'd like us to keep in mind. Because one of the things that we're definitely seeing in the second century is part of the army's social impact is to develop different kinds of societies. Then I'd like us to keep be mindful of the fact that in all of these problems, there's a seat just there. In all of these problems, it's worth thinking about the difference between short-term and long-term impact. And thinking about how different groups different social statuses, different identity groups are going to be profoundly differently affected by some of the things that we may simply refer to as social impact. Now, I promise I'll get on with the picture soon because this is an awful lot of words, isn't it? Um, but uh, it's supposed to be, really, because the point this slide simply makes is if you look in modern scholarship, you can find the Roman army and its social impact entangled in just about every discussion if you look hard enough. Road building, the development of transport infrastructure, administration, coin use, resource exploitation, driving urbanism, promoting Latin, dissemination of cult practice and belief, aiding and perhaps retarding social mobility, population movement forced and otherwise, and so on and so on. And of course, on top of all of this, there is this sense, as Aristides would argue, that the Roman army is providing a kind of security within which various trajectories can actually mature and develop long term. Now, I'm not going, you'll be very glad, I am not going to do all this in the next few minutes. Of course I'm not. I think one of the points I would like to stress with all these words is that you can actually find examples to support 
these somewhere in the Roman Empire relatively easily at some time or another. But they're not all happening at once. They're not all happening in the same way. And the way that they're happening in Italy and Britain is on quite a different time scale and in quite different manners, often. But there are some correlations. If we want to talk about social impact, one of the things we need to do, particularly if we want to have any hope of measuring it, thinking about its depth, thinking about its sustained impact, one of the things we need to think about is where are these armed and belted men? And generally speaking, in uh, scholarship and perhaps in casual conversation and in the general understanding of the Roman world, we're quite happy with the idea that there are a lot of soldiers wandering around Roman Britain. We can see this also in the archaeology. It's not just that they are conspicuous figures in the landscape with their forts. It's not just that they actually pop up very strikingly in the epigraphic record. It's not just in the array of small finds that point to militaria. We have generally a sense of a large military population in Britain. If we turn to the way that Roman Italy is studied in the High Imperial period, though, uh, the army is often less engaged with uh, by scholars. It's as if it is apart from many of the social questions in Italy in the High Imperial period. And yet, of course, Italy too has had ample opportunity to experience the Roman army in various forms. Most brutally, of course, we can think of the chilling tale where Vespasian's forces destroyed a Roman city, uh, Cremona in northern Italy. And I thank very much the team who are working on the Piazza Marconi uh, uh, excavations, due to be published this year, uh, for this rather striking image of one of the buildings that was destroyed as Roman soldiers ravaged through uh, that city. But there is other evidence that reminds us from time to time of how Roman soldiers, armed and belted men, were fairly pervasive figures in many areas of Roman Italy, travelling through it, performing odd tasks, serving as uh, emissaries in one form or another of the emperor. The Herculaneum soldier, for example, is one of that fascinating, tragic cross-section of human beings <coughs> Uh, recovered 300 or so souls whose remains have been excavated uh, on the uh, quayside. And we find him there, distinctive in society, with his cross belts, his sword, his dagger. But interestingly enough, and not often uh, noted, he has in addition to those a hammer and chisels. He is reminding us that, of course, although he would be identified as a soldier, he's more than that. Now one of the things that fascinated me as I was going back through uh, Oliver's very interesting uh, and influential translation of Aristides' speech is that he picks up an observation. For Aristides, the Roman period differs from previous periods in its freedom from fear. And of course, when Oliver was uh, publishing this translation, that phrase, freedom from fear, had a particular resonance. Not so very long since uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, of course, in his State of the Union address, uh, emphasised this as one of the great four freedoms. A freedom that was to be integrated into the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And of course, I think what all of that reminds us of is that fear has a social impact. Was the Roman Empire so free of fear? I don't think Oliver believed it, but of course Aristides presented such an idea. Now this then takes us beyond that to another aspect. Most recently, there's been a lot of work, and I think particularly of the excellent uh, Rebecca Redfern driving this, on a notion of how we might apply a web of violence approach to the study of societies. Explain briefly what Rebecca uh, is doing here, is she is reflecting on the particular cultural forms in which violence can be interlinked through society. The way that it can inhibit society, the way that individuals can suffer as a result. There is an interconnectedness. Now, it's very interesting if we look again at Roman literature and Roman archaeology in the High Imperial period to ask, how is the soldier seen in provincial society, and how, therefore, is the army itself, writ large, perceived? 
Let's start with satire. Now, OK, we might not want to take this literally, but I'm sure you're all familiar with Juvenal's 16th satire. The advantages of military service. The advantages are common to all. Violence, of course, and the advantages that a soldier has in any violent encounter with a civilian is emphasised here. And the story of a hobnailed judge, of course, a reference to military uh, sandals being one of the reasons why you cannot expect your uh, case to be heard justly in a military environment where soldiers will have an, uh, uh, um, uh, an advantage. Now, the point about juvenile satire, of course, is juvenile knew Rome very well indeed. And there's no need to think of this as a provincial story. Uh, this is something, a satire, that would have resonated, I think, with the people of Rome uh, in this golden age. And it resonates with somebody else as well. If we go to uh, the provinces, if we go to Britain, of course, the famous woes of a man from overseas are recounted on one of the Vindolanda tablets, uh, less than a couple of decades before Juvenal pens his satire 16. What's interesting about this is that it reflects the injustice that a traveller might be suffering as he moves around Roman society. But what's also interesting about this, and perhaps shouldn't surprise us, is that he is particularly appalled because he's a man from overseas and an innocent one. Not an innocent one and from overseas. He is from overseas and an innocent one. It's one thing to beat up the locals, but why me? <laughs> now, we could go on. In the second century, we have other examples. Lucius, during his unfortunate incarnation as an ass, of course, witnesses uh, an encounter with a legionary soldier. The legionary soldier is bested in this encounter, but that doesn't solve the problem because the legionary has friends and the army is always going to beat up on the civilians and get away with it. Literature, therefore, speaks to us of the army and the presence of soldiers as having a pervasive effect which can indeed gender, engender fear where they are encountered. Now let's now go to uh, look at the Roman world under Hadrian. And we're often rather inc uh, uh, inclined to see uh, the Emperor Hadrian uh, in his philosophical garb, um, perhaps less familiar with the image that the British Museum has uh, quite rightly promoted more recently, um, an image that would have been very familiar to many of those living in the cities of the Eastern Mediterranean, this armoured Hadrian, in this case actually stamping on a stylized representation of one of those involved in the Bar Kokhba uh, revolt uh, under his reign. Hadrian was an individual who was prepared to take extreme measures. And the Romans were quite explicit in their comments, comparing in a number of ways the extraordinary violence in the Near East with what took place uh, in Britain. And we all know what happened archaeologically after that, at least in broad outline. Hadrian orders a will, wall to be built. Now this wall, I should add, just keeps getting bigger. One of the things that strikes me is the more we look at it, the bigger it gets. I'm not just talking about the Cumbrian coast, fans of the Cumbrian coast don't <coughs> note, the important point that this is part of the system. The more work we do in this area, the bigger the settlements linked to the military appear to be. Yesterday, I was out doing more magnetometry at Corbridge, and Corbridge has just gotten bigger in the last 24 hours. So these Roman settlements are growing. The impact of this infrastructure is growing. Now, what does that mean in terms of social impact? If you put a wall like Hadrian's Wall through local society, one of the first things you're doing is you are disrupting agriculture. Here we are looking at excavations from West Denton, and you can actually see how once farmed fields uh, are no longer uh, in use. We're also now gauging social impact in this region in other ways. We're starting to see rather better settlements that were in fact in front of our eyes for a long time, but we did not have the technology uh, to see. So the great wind sill here, that marvellous feature along the centre of Hadrian's Wall, and we know of a number of late Iron Age settlements in this area, 
Fold Hill, only identified in 1990 through aerial photography, despite the fact that it was actually in clear sight of Housteads uh, for 2,000 years. These settlements are part of the landscape that we have to assess if we want to talk about social impact. What is the Roman army doing to society? What is this frontier doing to society? Now, for a long time, the key work here was by the great George Joby, the so-called One Man Royal Commission. And Joby would excavate these sites, but he always struggled because there was relatively little material culture. He used to boast, actually, that he could get the archive from any one of his sites into a shoebox. There wasn't much stuff. And stuff was important because when Joby was working, he wasn't able to call on a lot of radiocarbon dates. It was, have we got a Roman object here? OK, this indicates some kind of social impact, some kind of social interaction between army and society. But if there's not that stuff there, how do you actually go about dating it? So one of the very important developments we've seen in recent times has been the widespread use of radiocarbon dating on sites that previously we couldn't see. And this is where we have also benefited from large-scale rescue excavation, which has stripped back entire landscapes, meaning that sites that couldn't even have been seen through years of aerial photography are now being identified. And accompanied with uh, carbon-14 dating at many of these, and I think particularly of the excellent work of uh, my friends at Tyne and Weir Archives and Museums, most especially uh, Nick Hodgson here, what we're seeing is a lot more of these settlements, classic late Iron Age settlements. They're complex, they've got complex stories, complex spaces, complex ideas. And one common theme is emerging, particularly at the eastern end of Hadrian's Wall. At the western end, we're still working on some of the data. That is that there is either the cessation or the significant disruption and reformation of settlements in the second century AD. Hadrian's Wall is not just there, sort of tucked away in a corner. It is a massively disruptive impact, reaching far north uh, beyond its lines. Studying these structures, of course, uh, occasionally throws up some really, really nasty surprises. Um, we tend to think of roundhouses as a classic example of indigenous settlement. Now, before we get into the world of Hadrian, uh, we can see roundhouses, in this case at Findelanda, and in this case, rather intriguingly, coming right up against the fort wall. One might say, well, this is an interesting case. Natives seeking Roman security. We'll come back to that idea perhaps in a moment. But just to throw us archaeologists, one of the marvellous thing, things about this roundhouse is its finds assemblage is virtually indistinguishable from those found in the barracks at the same site at the same time. It's got writing tablets, it's got Roman shoes, it's got all of that fun stuff. So sometimes just working on the settlement morphology is itself a challenge. Now, obviously there is disruption. Disruption to society manifested by the changes in settlement pattern. But there's also that very important point if you take away vital resources from a society, you are going to change the way that that society works. Here we have a view of Vindolanda as we see it today. And one of the marvellous things my colleagues at the Vindolanda Trust have done, uh, and uh, the excellent Jackie Huntley has done, uh, is to look at this as at the heart of a landscape rich in resources. Now, we know that at one stage in Vindolanda's history, when it was prolifically producing those marvellous tablets. The unit in residence was the Cohors Prima uh, Batavorum Miliaria Equitata, a unit which probably boasted about 500 horses, mules, and other pack animals. Now just take this as a relatively measurable metric to think with. Jackie Huntley has looked at Vindlander and thought, how do you manage the land around a site like this in order to just sustain the presence of the army. And this is what Jackie has shown. You need grazing, you need grain, you need bracken. This is just for the horses, this is just for the equines. What is actually going to happen to any other kind of society that is trying to thrive and operate in this area? It's going to be significantly disrupted. 
And then we have to think about this in terms of other numbers. Now these I stress because we could all rip these numbers to shreds. Of course we could. I can justify how I've got to them later on and I can agree with you if you don't like them later on too. But to think with, it's very interesting to play with some numbers here. We can get a reasonable sense of the size of the Roman army. There are various estimates as to the population size of Roman Britain. Look at the ratios of soldier to civilian that emerge, first of all, if we look at Britain under Hadrian, if we look at the northern frontier under Hadrian, and if we look at the northern frontier under Marcus Aurelius. And think about the implications. If we're really looking at one soldier, perhaps 45 uh, civilians uh, in Roman Britain at that golden time, what implications is that going to have to on social impact? Clearly the impact of the military is not going to be evenly spread across Britain, but that allows for some really quite dense and concentrated exchanges. And I note that that is a figure for soldiers. Remember that the soldiers are just the nucleus of a military community, which includes those people whose lives are specifically bound up with that professional group. So, we have areas of Britain where the concentration of the military at certain moments in time will have been extraordinarily pronounced. What is that doing to society? Very difficult to offer simple answers, but I think it is important to remember that as we look at the often lopsided evidence for the Roman professional military community, that we can see that there is nonetheless a cultural fusion too, even in this area. And what we see here are two examples, a personal adornment, or three actually, but two categories of uh, personal adornment that reflect this. The remarkable dragon-esque brooches, which are a splendid artistic hybrid uh, of uh, Roman metalworking uh, techniques being introduced to the area and uh, Celtic art. And the bracelets, the glass bracelets uh, that we find uh, too from the first century BC onwards indicating that glass that can only have come into this area really through Rome is then being reused to create attractive adornments that appeal to a local aesthetic. So much for a British story. I think we all know a little bit uh, about uh, the situation in Britain. What happens uh, if we look at the situation in Rome? Well, we all know a little bit about this too. When we look at the military in Rome, what we're often doing is actually, as a larger community, taking a more conventional classical art history approach to the military in Rome. And we're looking at monuments that celebrate Rome's military prowess as public propaganda monuments. And these have been read as quite literal explanations of the Roman army on operations. They're actually a very important filter um, and a way of presenting a particular message to Roman society. Here, alongside the many scenes of combat that adorned uh, Trajan's column and its celebration of uh, Roman victory in two Dacian wars in Transylvania in the early second century, a monument that of course is still new at the beginning of Hadrian's reign. Um, in this one we can see the Roman army as uh, also an army that builds, that is building the infrastructure around which society is going to have to react, whether it likes it or not. And so our discussions of Rome tend to place the military as part of a almost uh, symbolic uh, entity. And yet at the same time we know that armed and belted men were repeatedly to play a vital role in shaping the politics of empire and the fate of emperors and with them, of course, their subjects. And if we look again at the topography of Rome, one of the things we see is more and more evidence for a military presence. Some of this is well known. The notorious Praetorian Guard, of course, had a substantial camp uh, in the reign of Tiberius. Note the distance, of course, from the Roman Forum. 
It's not really a significant distance. You can threaten the forum from there, but it seems moderately discreet, perhaps, on a map. Augustus has a Castra Peregrina. We don't know very much about how this functioned. It's somewhere over here. Um, and it's for all those soldiers who are actually going through Rome, performing the extended functions uh, of uh, the emperor, serving as messengers, perhaps special duty soldiers, the essential cogs in an administrative machine without which we can't even begin to talk about real and fundamental social change. And by the time of Trajan, we have around here what's known as the Castra Priora now of the Equites Singulares, that guard cavalry force that are the vital counterpoint in the emperor's security to the Praetorian Guard, recruited uh, from the auxiliaries of uh, the provinces, the auxiliary cavalry of the provinces. Now, we don't tend to think of Hadrian as necessarily spending as much time in Rome as his predecessors, because he didn't. He was traveling a great deal. And when we do talk about recent discussions of Hadrian's legacy uh, in Rome, it's to have um, discussions about buildings of quite another sort. But as many of you would, I'm sure, have picked up, uh, work on the metro uh, line C uh, has uh, generated some very interesting uh, alternative pictures uh, of life in Rome during the Hadrianic period. And what we can see here are the excavations uh, at the Amber uh, Aradam site, possibly indicating another military installation founded by Hadrian and previously unknown. Now, I have the very considerable privilege of working uh, on our upcoming Lateran volume in which the excellent uh, Rosella Rea is actually going to be giving a detailed uh, discussion in English uh, of her uh, thinking on this site. Rosella believes that this is a, a substantial military installation um, and the very fact that we didn't know about it before raises interesting questions about how much we really know about the Hadrianic topography of Rome and how many other missing military elements there might be. I remain actually, for my part, slightly agnostic. There is something quasi barrack like about these matching rooms, um, but I think there may yet be other explanations for them. Um, but they are not inconsistent, when you look at them archaeologically, with some of those things that we can definitively say are military buildings in Rome. Now, that's the situation we've got at the beginning of the second century. What is happening if we go towards the end of the second century? And I'd like now to think more text, more words, um, about life under Septimius Severus. Now, Septimius Severus, of course, does not have a particularly good press. And one or two of you will think I'm quoting uh, Dio perhaps too often and without su sufficient qualification. But I think it's very interesting to see that Dio picks up uh, a number of themes about social impact, social impact in Italy, and the link to the army. And one of the points that Dio makes, which is fascinating, is he says, actually, there are social implications not as a result of recruitment in Italy, but as a result of the cessation of certain recruiting practices in Italy. We may not necessarily choose to believe him. In any society racked by brigandage, there will be multiple people who will be blamed for uh, the problem. But it is interesting in this passage that Dio stresses that point. And he also says something else that is very interesting. He talks famously about the fact that when Severus comes in to Rome, he brings in all sorts of outsider soldiers. Now, up until now, we've been looking at a bunch of outsider soldiers on the frontiers doing their thing and brutalising the locals. Dio is flipping this around. It's the provincials who are coming into Rome, and they are the aliens, and they're making everybody feel rather uncomfortable. And of course, Dio's group, those of the senatorial class, are going to be particularly threatened by this. It's not just the most weak and vulnerable in society. Now, that becomes very interesting when we actually think about some numbers again. Uh, here, I owe a debt to uh, John Colston, uh, who's worked extensively on these figures. Um, John has looked at these numbers and he has come up with some very interesting figures 
for the likely ratios of soldiers to civilians in Rome itself. Now remember that Septimius Severus does all sorts of rather terrifying things to threaten society in Rome, to secure his own position. He brings a legion, the Second Parthica, up to within striking distance from Rome, and then he packs it with soldiers. So by the time of Severus, we are seeing potentially one person in every 45, maybe every 38, maybe still a smaller ratio on the streets of Rome as an armed and belted individual of some sort. Rome becomes the most intensely militarised settlement that we can identify uh, in the centre of the empire. And therefore there is the ir irony that while we tend to think about the army in Italy as either something that was part of an earlier history, better forgotten, those myths that Aristides refers to, or as something that simply adorns monuments or accompanies the emperor in a rather ceremonial form, we actually have the best archaeology, archaeological examples of many classic elements of Roman uh, military archaeology actually to be found anywhere in the empire. And here we are at Albano, a short distance from Rome, where we have the best preserved legionary fortress in the entire empire. Who'd have thought it? Now, what does this mean for Rome itself? Physically, it also means a transformation. If we start plotting these, and I put these in a rather, what would you call that colour? Because I'm colour blind. I think this is sort of a, a sort of creamish, pinkish thing. Anyway, what I've done is I've just stacked these up a little bit. And what you start to see is an enormous military footprint in the southeast of Rome. And if you think how close we are to the Forum, I mean, that, that is a short, a very short walk. I commute there very regularly from the Lateran. You're talking a matter of mere minutes. If you're on a horse, you're talking about mirror minutes. So, the military presence is significant here. It's changing the shape and form of Rome. And if we look at the archaeology, we can see how dramatic that Severan transformation could be. Underneath the Lateran, here we go, we're crawling around underneath the Lateran. The Lateran Basilica, San Giovanni Laterano, Greg mentioned it, the Pope's Cathedral actually sits on top of one of those bases that's introduced by Septimius Severus to house or accommodate one of the two units of Equites Singularis he has, guard cavalry. We can actually see what happens. Beforehand, we've got beautiful residential dwellings. Absolutely lovely. Look at this. They were recently replastered, probably in the Hadrianic period. And then, bang, they are broken down. Brick Vaulting is placed because a new platform is constructed right over the top of them to support an entire cavalry fort. And we can even see who done it. Because right here, scribbled, where one of the working parties must have rested while bring, building this brick coffers, we can see the doodlings of bored soldiers. Cohors Tertia has been in action here no doubt taking a certain amount of pleasure in pulling down the fine residential dwellings and transforming the face of Rome. And here, for the first time ever in, in Britain, anywhere in fact, is our reconstruction of what we think the Castra Nova actually looked like. Now you have to remember that this is just another fort introduced by Severus into the landscape of Rome. It is surrounded by residential quarters, something we might expect to see otherwise in the provinces. Now. Moving on, who lived there? Well, we know a lot about the people who lived there. This is one of them, Marcus Aurelius Bithus. He's one of the Equites Singularis, and he tells us he's from the Castronova. He looks rather different to our poster boy earlier on, Longinus, but he's actually also of Thracian descent. In this case, though, he's rather happy to trumpet that Thracian descent. There we have uh, all of the aspects, the hunting dog, grabbing a boar by the nose, the flayed out uh, cloak that speak to the cult of the Thracian hero. This is art in Rome generated ultimately in Thrace. Religious practice found on the altars of the capital, again brought in by the army, and echoes out in Bulgaria of the actual ritualised underpinning, the association of dog and horse, part of a particularly Balkan view of messages to the underworld. 
What's happening with the messages to the underworld who are reaching northern Britain? A few points I would note. Dio speaks of vast armies actually coming with Severus to Britain. He's been accused of exaggeration, but in fact, if we look at the landscape of Britain, if we look at these marvellous aerial photographs that show us the 260 or so known marching or temporary camps that are to be found in the northern British landscape, we can see that many of these are actually from the campaigns of Severus. They would indeed have accommodated vast armies. What are they doing? Dio speaks of this as a military disaster. Others, notably Dr Colin Martin, have argued that this is incredibly shrewd planning. Take a vast army up the east coast of Scotland on the richest agricultural lands. When you've withdrawn, what is left for the remainder of the population? Certainly after Severus's foray into Scotland, society is substantially maladjusted for generations. And the Romans have, so far as at least the literary sources would allow, relatively little to concern themselves with for a generation or more. Severus has an impact too on Hadrian's frontier. Back to Vindolanda, and we see something rather strange. We've seen Rome being turned more and more into an armed camp. Now we see the regular forts, and this doesn't apply to all of them by any means, but some of the regular forts of Hadrian's Wall are redesigned in dramatic ways. Here, for example, at Vindolanda, a new Severan fortlet is constructed, looking rather unlike what we're used to, and where previously the fort was, there are multiple roundhouses. Who are these people? What are they doing? New research at Vindolanda will, I hope, help us to understand this, but it looks almost like uh, native populations are being brought in to occupy a Roman fort, almost the reverse, then, of what we have in Rome. Now, by way of conclusion, I'd like to stay with Vindolanda and just talk about one person's story. Conversations about social impact actually frequently miss the issue of the individual. And only very occasionally do we come face to face with those individuals in archaeology. In the Severan ditch at Vindolanda that we've just seen, we did indeed come face to face uh, with uh, this, uh, with an individual. Uh, my colleagues from the Vindolanda Trust unearthed this skull. We know it as Skull 8658. And the skull tells a story. It's been extensively examined, both from a paleopathological point of view, also from the perspective of isotopic analysis, and most recently from the analysis of its DNA. The first point to note is that this individual died very horribly indeed. Massive trauma, chopping down both sides of the head, and very strong evidence that the head was displayed on a post. Not a nice way to go. Then came the analysis of the teeth. Lots of very interesting science, very important science, and we can sum it up by saying this individual was drinking water, for the most part, that would be consistent with a UK origin. So far, so good or so bad. Following on from the vision of the Roman army and its impact and that pacifistic, perhaps, view that sometimes emerges of the Roman army as state builder rather than actually primarily instrument of the emperor for whatever dirty deeds he has in mind, we might turn to Trajan's column once more. And here we see barbarian heads on posts, an aspect of Rome's impact that was particularly gory. Naturally enough, when one thinks of that skull, one imagines that that is what we're seeing, a particularly brutal demonstration of Rome's power visited on some unfortunate native on the frontier. But then the third stage of analysis came through. Dr Eleanor Graham, our excellent colleague from the University of Northumbria, did DNA analysis on the skull. And what did her DNA analysis reveal? Italian paternity. The point about this is that that violence that we've seen enacted on individuals, used as an instrument of terror and transformation, a part of the seasoning of social impact in the Roman world, is actually not necessarily so far 
apart in Italy and Britain. Society is closely bound up, and the army is a vital instrument which sometimes behaves remarkably similar to Italians as it does to Britons on a distant frontier. Thank you very much. Thank you.